lecturers tonight or tonight this evening and tomorrow's evening at Okay, great. All right, so let's get to the last lecture, which is, so I want to begin, so uh, before the coffee break, we talked about direct detection strategies and how, we, um, and you know, the classic direct detection searches that have set very strong constraints on dark matter baryon scattering cross sections at 10 GeV and higher, and the recent advances in direct detection at low masses, which are probing below the 10 GeV scale down towards the MeV scale. So what I want to begin with here is say a little bit about dark matter searches and dark sector searches at accelerators. This is going to be a very um, brief, this is going to be a relatively brief discussion since there's a lot to say here. And then I want to move away from the high mass side of dark matter, so from the particle-like dark matter above the KeV scale that we've been talking about so far, and move on to talk about the light dark matter, the ultra light and ultralight bosonic, cold bosonic dark matter region of parameter space with the QCD axion as our primary example. All right, so here is my attempt to summarize the kinds of LHC searches that you can do for dark matter uh, with one slide. So the basic idea of dark matter searches at, collider, at accelerators, as opposed to um, mediator searches at accelerators, is that dark matter is stable. We know it's stable on the lifetime of the universe, so that means that if we make it at an accelerator, it's going to get out of the detector. It can't be detected directly, that means, but it will show up as missing energy and momentum. Th there are some other kinds of searches that you can have, like in, in the cases of minimal dark matter that we talked about, for example, the dark matter has charged partners that are just a little heavier, so you can have um, alternative signatures involving those charged parts, partners. But the most directed model-independent dark matter searches at the LHC are some kind of search where you look for missing energy and some standard model particles recoiling against it. So, for, so these are sort of cartoons of, so, of some of the processes that could give rise to this behavior. You need to be able to say, see something recoiling against the missing energy and momentum to measure the missing energy and momentum. So this is a case where quarks and antiquarks annihilating into dark matter particles could produce uh, a standard model particles from the final state. So you would look for a recoiling photon or a jet um, or, or, a, or a Higgs combined with missing energy. You could, you could also radiate these particles from mediators, or you could radiate them from some process in the final state. Now, for that, so a lot of LHC searches for dark matter of this form, like monohigs or monojet or monophoton, it doesn't necessarily need to be mono. There could be multiple standard model particles recoiling from this interaction. So you could do that kind of search. When you do that kind of search, and you want to translate it to a dark matter model, you have a couple of different possibilities. So first, you could say, OK, I'm going to take a top-down approach. I'm going to construct a detailed model for my high-energy physics. For example, some like parameter point in, super, in supersymmetry, parameter space. Um, and you could search for the resulting signatures from that. Now, the upside is, in SUSY models, there are lots of non-dark matter particles. There's a partner for every standard model particle. And that can have really striking effects. So for example, characteristic signatures of supersymmetry can include um, like cascade decays, where you produce a heavy supersymmetric particle, and then it decays all the way down to the lightest supersymmetric particle, producing lots of standard model particles on the way. So that can be a signature that involves lots of standard model particles and a significant amount of missing, of missing energy and momentum. The downside, so these absolutely searches you can do. There are lots of papers by Atlas and by CMS setting constraints on various parts of SUSY parameter space. The downside of this approach is that it's somewhat difficult to, once you've set some constraints on one model, it's somewhat difficult to translate those constraints into bounds on a different dark matter model. So you constrain a model, not necessarily just the, the prospect of dark matter as a whole. And so the interpretation in the context of the original model you tested is very straightforward. The interpretation in terms of other models is pretty challenging. So another approach that has been widely used is to construct simplified models with only a few ingredients, where we say, and, and try to develop generic searches for those ingredients. 
The upside is, so this could be, for example, something like the portal models that we talked about. We say, okay, we've got dark matter, we've got a mediator, the mediator could be a vector or a scalar or an axial vector or a pseudo scalar. It has some coupling to standard model particles. Let's look for the effects of that. The advantage of these simplified models is that it's easy to translate to a lot of different models, and it reduces the risk of missing a signal because you search for one very specific model-dependent signature that wasn't actually realized in our universe. But the downside is that sometimes the effects of those extra ingredients of the full models are important. And in general, there's not always a guarantee that a simple, an arbitrary simplified model that you write down can be embedded into a reasonable high energy theory. So the usual feeling is these approaches are complementary. We can do both of them at the same time. There's also a related version of this, which could be thought of as AS1 way to generate a simplified model, which is use an effective field theory approach. Just think about the possible operators through which dark matter could couple to um, to the standard model and try to constrain those operators. This does rely on being able to self-consistently integrate out the heavy degrees of freedom. This doesn't always work. You can have situations where you try to do an effective field theory approach, but you find that the uh, parameters that you can constrain correspond only to parameters where your effective field theory is not valid. And so then you have a breakdown. So this is an example of the simplified model approach in the latter case, where you can suppose dark matter couples to some heavy mediator, uh, which also couples to quarks. And so then you can have a situation where exchange of that mediator could allow pair production of dark matter through quark, um, anti-quark annihilation, and it can also you know, allow production of other particles. Then you can consider different possibilities for the spin of that mediator. So this is just an example plot based on 13 TV atlas data from a few years ago, uh, where you just set constraints on the mediator mass. That it, so this plot is the dark matter mass versus the mediator mass. This is putting in some specific couplings to the standard um, between the standard model and the mediator and the dark matter and the mediator. This is for the case of an axial vector mediator with direct dark matter. And you know, so then you can take the simplified model and say, okay, in these, th these different LHC searches exclude these different regions of parameter space. And you can see that in this case, like digest searches allow you to get constrained mediator masses up to about 2.5 or 2.6 TV. So I'm not going to try to show you every result for dark matter constraints from the LHC. It would be completely impossible, but many of the searches are of their, this general form. Now, of course, we're not restricted to the LHC. There are other accelerators in existence, although generally the LHC is going to be the best when the, the test is how heavy new physics can you constrain, since it has the highest center of mass energy. But for light dark, maybe you don't care about new physics at 3 TeV. Maybe you care about new physics at 1 GeV or 100 MeV. And in cases like that, where the dark matter is light or it interacts with the standard model through new light mediators, then high luminosity might be more important than high energy. So there's an active program of uh, accelerator experiments to search for both dark matter that interacts with the standard model through new mediators and just to search directly for the new mediators. And the immediate target of that program, which is nicely summarized in the RF6 topical report uh, from Snowmass by Gori et al., is to basically probe the full set of interaction strengths compatible with light dark matter thermal freeze out. So they're initially focusing on this thermal freeze out benchmark uh, via the simplest mechanism of S channel annihilation of standard model particles mediated by a dark photon. So these are these are some examples of the kinds of searches that you can that you can do with these cases. So this is sort of like the already ruled out, um, about to be ruled out far future plots that I showed earlier for direct detection. So in this case, this is the dark matter mass on the x-axis. So this is dark matter masses from around the MeV to the GeV scale. So this is that light um, the thermal dark matter region that we looked at. These black, oops, these black lines here correspond to different um, thermal relic milestones. The different lines correspond to dark matter being, for example, a Dirac fermion versus a Majorana fermion versus sc a scalar of some kind. And I'll say a little bit more about um, you know, what, why, where these benchmark comes from and why it's good to use accelerators to look for them on the next slide. This is assuming, um, so this is for a particular case where the mediator is a dark vector. This, this is, the, dark, the mediator is a dark vector that is heavier than the dark matter. So as we talked about yesterday, 
In those circumstances, the dark matter annihilates through an offshore mediator into standard model particles. The mass of the mediator and the couplings of the mediator of the dark matter in the standard model generate basically an effective direct coupling between the dark matter and the standard model. And that effective coupling is this parameter that's called Y here. So epsilon is the mediator standard model coupling, alpha D is the mediator dark matter coupling, and then there's this ratio of the dark matter mass to the mediator mass uh, that, that factors into this. So in this case, because you know, we can effectively like take out the, the mediator, we say, okay, there's just some effective coupling controlled by Y between the dark matter and the standard model. Within a given model for the dark matter, we can do the thermorelic calculation, figure out what value of Y gives you the correct annihilation cross-section. That gives you these black lines. And then we can ask how we can search for these at a range of accelerators. And basically the gray region is currently what they can exclude for these models. The blue is the projected reach of experiments that are currently operating, and the red is uh, upcoming experiments that have been proposed. So, um, so these experiments are starting to get to a point where you can probe at least you know simple simplified models of thermorelic dark matter pretty effectively for these light mass scales. The the lower panel is showing an example where instead you um, Right, so, sorry, let me remember how this works, right. The lower, this lower panel is showing instead what happens if you have a dark photon that is lighter than the dark matter. So this is a direct search for, this is a direct search for a dark photon, for a mediator, again, sort of, so, so this is, right, okay. I'll say, I'll say this, this, this is just an example of how you can search directly for a mediator without caring about how it's coupled to the dark matter. So when searching for these thermorelic targets, the, the, the argument that proponents of these accelerator searches give is that when we do direct and indirect searches, we're largely measuring dark matter interactions at an energy scale relevant to the present day halo. So where dark matter is highly non-relativistic and V is around 10 to the minus three. But when we think about the thermorelic mechanism, when we think about thermal freeze out, that was occurring in the early universe when the dark matter was pretty close to being relativistic, right? We said M, M over T was order 20. So that corresponds to you know, V of like a third. So at accelerators, you can potentially reproduce those early universe conditions, which means that you're actually probing the effect of dark matter standard model coupling at energies that are comparable to the energies that freeze out. And so in scenarios where the effective coupling is strongly energy dependent, and in particular gets suppressed at low energies, accelerators are a good way to close that gap in direct and, in, in direct and indirect detection. Just as an example, I said that from indirect detection from CMB bounds, we have an argument that if dark matter is lighter than about 10 GeV, then you need to suppress its annihilation cross-section at late times. A common way of doing that is having the annihilation cross-section be very suppressed at low velocities. So in the, the accelerator program says, that's great, fine. Your interaction cross-section can be very suppressed at, at low velocities, no problem. We'll just run an accelerator, recover the high energies of thermal freeze out and be able to test. And in that sense, we will be able to test thermal freeze out directly. So that's what leads to this relatively narrow range of expected signals for thermorelic dark matter in this plot. Like the answer does depend somewhat on the details of your model, but at some level it's, um, it's less dependent than say for, uh, direct detection cross section. So this is the point being made in this upper panel here where if you look at um, direct detection experiments and you ask, all right, for, for this sort of simplified class of models where dark matter is a Majorana um, fermion or a Dirac fermion, or, an elas or, or a scalar, uh, what is sort of the range of scattering signals that you expect in direct detection experiments? And, and it can be very wide, even for these relatively simple thermalized model, thermorelic models, whereas in accelerators, just because you, you, you don't get to have large energy, large energy scale hierarchies, the potential band is much smaller. Okay. So as well, so again, um, read the Gore et al report if you want to see all the details of how this works. I guess I'll just say that there are multiple searches for dark matter um, 
for mediators decaying to something invisible, such as the dark matter, for dark matter being produced and causing missing energy, for, dark, for a mediator being produced and decaying visibly into standard model particles, for the production of like, long-lived states that can decay uh, to at later points. So there are multiple channels by which to probe the dark matter production. And you can also just look directly for the mediators. Like, forget about the dark matter, say, OK, I don't care about missing energy. Uh, I just want to look for mediators coupled to the standard model through these minimal portals. And we can search for both decays of mediators to standard model particles or invisible decays of the mediators into the dark sector. Um, Another thing that you can do, which is pretty neat, is you can use existing accelerators, including the LHC, as a production source for long-lived particles, so a production source for these mediators if they live long enough, and then stick other detectors like in the, in the, along the beamline of the LHC or in the surrounding area and search for the displaced decays of those long-lived particles. So detectors like Phaser and Codex B and Methuselah use, the, use this approach. And this is... This is just another example of a search for a mediator directly. This time it's for a scalar, so that mixes with the Higgs boson with some mixing angle theta and decays visibly into standard model particles. And so we can, we can test relatively large mixing angles at the moment, but with these searches for long-lived particles, you can potentially get to, uh, to much smaller couplings. All right, that is my brief description of the landscape of accelerator searches. It's you know, ne necessarily pretty short because this is a huge area, but um, hopefully it gives you some guidance in what to look for and where to look if you want to follow that up. Okay, so now, so far, we've been focusing mostly on the KEV scale and higher for dark matter. But in my remaining time, I want to talk about the huge swath of dark matter parameter space that I have not really covered in the previous lectures, which is axions and wave-like dark matter more generally. So we've said that for mass scales below about 1 keV, dark matter must be both bosonic and should avoid thermal contact with the standard model. Um, we don't want it because we don't want it to get too warm. So stable light bosons that are sufficiently cold can be good dark matter candidates down to masses of 10 to the minus 21 electron volts. And the most classic example of this is the QCD axion. So let's talk a little bit about this. So the QCD axion is motivated as a particle in the spectrum independently from dark matter by the strong CP problem. So the strong CP problem is the statement that if we write down what terms could possibly exist in the standard model Lagrangian, then we would expect a term that looks like this. So G mu nu here is the field strength for the gluon. Uh, this term is gauge invariant. It respects the symmetries of the standard model. It does it, theta here is just a constant. It doesn't conserve CP, but the standard model doesn't conserve, so um, charge parity symmetry, charge conjugation parity combined symmetry, but the standard model doesn't conserve CP either. So there's no particular reason in principle that this term shouldn't be there. In fact, you know, just if we look at how we usually set up the standard model, there are some redefinitions of the quark fields which we would naturally expect to generate a term that is like this. Um, there's no particular reason for that term to vanish. However, if this term is present, it would induce a neutron, um, it would induce a neutron electric dipole moment. And my neutron electric dipole moment mi is missing a theta here. Sorry, there, there, should, there should be a theta in this expression. I don't know where that went. Um, the expected size of this neutron electric dipole moment would be about 5 times 10 to the minus 16 times the value of theta in these centimeters. But experimentally, we know that the neutron dipole moment is more than 10 orders of magnitude smaller than that. So that tells you that this theta parameter, if it's there at all, should be less than about 10 to the minus 10. And it's just not at all obvious why it should be so small. I mean, again, just from known standard model processes, you would expect sort of an order one contribution to this theta unless there's something that cancels it out. So the axiom proposal is to say, all right, if I see a parameter that appears to be zero, and, you know, but I have no reason to think it should be zero, let's introduce a dynamical mechanism to make it zero. So let's replace this parameter theta by a dynamical field which we'll call A divided by FA, where A is the field and 1 over FA is an effective coupling. And so then we just need to explain why A would evolve towards a very small value. So now it's a dynamical field. That come up. Well, if we want to explain why a field could, would evolve towards a particular value, one thing that we might think about is, okay, maybe that value is a minimum of potential energy somehow, right? 
And it turns out that you know this works pretty well in this case. The energy stored in this there's energy stored in this field as a result of this term in the Lagrangian, and then energy de depends on the value of a. Now, working at, you can work out this effective potential using some um, clever tricks involving using the pion mass as a, pro as a probe of the structure of the QCD vacuum. If you want to, Michael Dine has TASI lectures which go through this with some simple examples and then the full QCD example. But what you end up finding is this potential which describes the amount of um, potential energy in the system as a function of the value of this A field looks like this. So these m pi and f pi here, the, so m, m pi here is the mass of the pions, f pi is the effective um, energy scale associated with the pions, so it's also like around uh, 100 MeV. So these are, and mu, md are the masses of the up and down quarks. And, uh, and, and then there is this, sinu and then there is this um, sinusoidal behavior, this oscillatory behavior associated with the value of A. All right, so again, I'm not going to go into the details of where this comes from, just that it, it comes from using the pion masses. Of, it, it comes from um, some features of the QCD vacuum, and, using the, and we can use the pion masses as a probe of those features of the vacuum. But so this tells us, okay, this is interesting. We have this, we have this oscillatory potential in A, and look, it has a minimum at, uh, at A equals zero. Okay, so that sounds promising. We'd like the field to evolve towards small values of this potential. The minima occur at A over FA equals 2m pi, so we'll look at the n equals 0 minimum. Okay, so the potential is parabolic, so we can think of the, the coefficient of the A squared term is going to give us a term in the Lagrangian that looks like um, A squared times a constant, so that's like a mass term for the axion. So expand, Taylor expanding out this potential around the minimum, we get behavior that looks like this. Um, so that means that we're going to get an effective mass for the axion around its potential minimum that looks like this. So this gives us a direct relation between the mass of the axion and if it solves this strong CP problem and its, and its scale FA. Now I will say, as always, there are theory loopholes to this. People have worked on more complicated QCD axion models where this relationship is broken. But this is, the, this is sort of the standard QCD axion calculation. Okay, so if FA was 10 to the 10 GeV, the axion mass would have to be 0.6 milliEV. If, uh, and, and you know, parametrically, this just says that FA times MA should be about the same as F pi times M pi. So it's related really to the QCD scale. All right, so recall that FA is, we replace theta with A over FA. So one over FA is like the effective coupling of the axion to this field strength of the gluons. So. 1 over FA controls all the couplings of the axion to the standard model fields. Now, we wrote down this sort of defining coupling that the axion couples to, um, the, the, cu couples to the gluon field strength. It can also couple to other standard model particles. The details of those couplings depend on the details of the model and you know, the UV level, where exactly does this A field come from. So the DFSE axion, the axion has couplings to photons, gluons, leptons, and quarks. The KSVZ, or hadronic axion, has a different set of couplings where the axion basically just couples only to photons and gluons. So we've seen that the axion mass is inversely proportional to, so it scales, yeah, okay. So the, the axion mass goes like one over FA, which is the same as the coupling to standard model fields. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I guess this is slightly misphrased. It's inversely proportional to FA, which is inversely proportional to the coupling to the standard model fields. So if we want the axion to be weakly coupled to standard model fields, it also needs to be really light. Now, you might say, okay, well, oh, if the axion is very light, maybe that, then it will be a poor dark matter candidate because it will be too hot. But this is the relationship that you want Sorry. This is the relationship that you want for, um, for cold dark matter. As we go to lower and lower masses, the coupling to the standard model gets smaller, and so the chances of thermalization also become smaller. All right, but let's, so let's first think about the situation of do axions thermalize with the standard model at all? At sufficiently low masses, the coupling of axions to the standard model is pretty weak. So we can ask the question of did they ever get into equilibrium? You know, did they did they, you know, did they reach equilibrium or did they do something more like freeze-in, where we produce some axions but not at the thermal abundance? If they got into equilibrium, how did they get out of it? So axions would be produced in the early universe by interactions of photons and pions. 
So this is a freeze-in process, just as we discussed. Axions can also decay, and that coupling, you know, it just has a single axion in it, A G mu nu, G mu nu. So that means that axions are in principle unstable. There's no symmetry keeping them stable. So if we want axions to be a diagmatic candidate, we have to check that like we don't overproduce them in the early universe. We don't make a lot of them that are too hot to be the dark matter. And um, that once we make them, they stick around. So their lifetime is much longer than the age of the universe. So let's do the lifetime check first. So that you can work out the uh, time scale for the axions to decay. It's just like a nice, a nice tree-leveled result. We'll write that. We can write this in terms of the coupling to the standard model, 1 over FA. We can use our previous result to convert this into a dependence on the axion mass. And we get a time scale that looks like this. So an EV scale axion decays with a lifetime of about 10 to the 24 seconds, which is seven orders of magnitude longer than the age of the universe. And it scales like MA to the minus 5. So, so sub-EV axions um, get uh, pretty long-lived, pretty quickly. So that tells us that for axions to be around today, th the problem is that when I hit the um, pointer, it, half the time it advances it as well. So, um, so that means that for axions to be around today, they must be lighter than about 20 EV, unless you have a specific model that stops them from decaying. Now, it, it's actually also true that at axion masses between about 20 EV and 300 keV, the photons from those decays would mess with nuclear synthesis, so they wouldn't be dark matter, but we also you know, know that they, like, that, 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 you know, if they were produced in the early universe, they shouldn't be around in the spectrum. So, we can, so, so that's the decay question. So we need like, axions to be shorter than about 20 EV to be long-lived enough to um, potentially still be around today. So then we have this other condition that if the axions are all too strongly coupled, they'll come into thermal equilibrium with the standard model. So solving the Boltzmann equation, we find that they could attain thermal equilibrium in the early universe if the axion mass was greater than about um, 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3 EV. And you can work out, OK, so then you say, all right, um, they got into thermal equilibrium. How much of them is left today? In that case, you find that very roughly the fraction of the critical density in these thermally produced axions would be about the axion mass divided by 100 EV. So these thermally produced axions would be hot dark matter, as we've discussed. You know, they're, they're, at the, they're below 100 EV, they'd be warm or hot, they'd better not be all the dark matter, they're excluded. So this tells us that if the axion mass is less than about 1 EV, there'll be less than this thermal contribution will be less than about 1% of the total dark matter, and that's probably okay from hot dark matter bounds. It's actually interesting that just looking at this thermally produced axion component and uh, its, its observational consequences can, in some cases, set stringent bounds on axions and axion-like particles. OK. So, but okay, so this, th these arguments sort of tell us that so long as the axion is lighter than about 1 EV, it probably will not produce a significantly large fraction, a significantly enough large fraction of the dark matter to be ruled out on hot dark matter bounds, and it will still be around in the present day. Okay, so, but, okay, so that's fine, but we don't want thermal axions to be the dark matter because we're hot dark matter. So what about non-thermal axions to generate all of the dark matter? If axions never equilibrate with the standard model and remain sufficiently cold, then sufficiently cold light axions behave more like a classical scalar field evolving in an axion potential than as individual um, particles. So we can ask, all right, if you have a classical scalar field in the early universe, another way to say this is this is kind of like the zero mode of the axion field, so there's a coherent um, condensate mode. So we can ask, how does that field evolve over time? And the picture is here, well, okay, if, we, if the field value, so x-axis here is like the value of the field A, if it's initially displaced from the minimum of the potential, then it will try to evolve towards the minimum of the potential. But just as if I had a bowl and I put a little ball up the side of the bowl and let it go, it wouldn't just immediately go to the bottom and stop. It would roll back and forward um, around that minimum. And we call the distance to with which the axion field is initially separated from the minimum the misalignment angle. All right, so this is going to probably come up again when you, study, uh, when you study inflation or similar things. But so to understand what happens in this case, we need to study the behavior of an evolving scalar field in an expanding universe. And so this is what the evolution equation looks like. This term here could really be replaced with the axion potential overall. So, um, but, but here we've replaced it with the axion mass since that determines the shape of the potential around its minimum. So, 
looking at this, looking at this equation of motion, we can uh, see that there are a couple of different regimes here. So where the axion mass is really um, is is very small, where MA, where this term with the axion mass is very small compared to the others, there's actually a solution to the equations where dA by dt is just zero. So the axion field doesn't evolve; it's just frozen. But once h become, but once h is smaller than the axion mass, the field will begin to oscillate within the potential. And this is basically this equation of motion. This equation of motion is basically the equation of a simple harmonic oscillator with a friction term. So, we, so this is sometimes called, uh, this, you know, if I didn't have this term, this Hubble term, this would literally just be the simple harmonic oscillator. Okay? So we sometimes call this the Hubble friction. And so this is going to just oscillate back and forth in the potential. Because of the Hubble expansion, that oscillation will get damped over time and it will end up down at the minimum. So we can guess, so for large t, the solution is going to have this approximate form. You start out with some misalignment angle. You have some oscillatory behavior controlled by the axial mass terms, just like the simple harmonic oscillator result. And then you have this f of t, this slowly varying term that's going to be controlled by, um, that's going to be controlled by the Hubble expansion. When we sort, we can just plug this ansatz into this equation, solve of f of t, and what you'll find is that this f of t parameter scales like a to the minus 3 halves. Okay, so now let's just look at the energy density. So this is how the field evolves. So it has this overall a to the minus three half scaling from the expansion of the universe, and then some oscillations with a um, scale governed by the governed by the axion mass. So if we look at the energy density stored in this component, it has both kinetic and potential components. We just write down the uh, energy density of a scalar field. It looks like this. We can plug in our ansatz from before. And we're going to have, you know, just like you have for a simple harmonic oscillator, where the en with energy has kinetic and potential components, and one of them goes like sine squared theta, and the other one goes like cos squared theta. We're going to get the same behavior here, and we'll find that the total energy stored in the field goes like this f of t squared scaling factor times parameters that depend on the axion mass and the misalignment angle. We found that f of t scales like a to the minus 3 halves. So this says that the energy density doesn't actually oscillate rapidly, even though the field oscillates back and forth. The total energy just decays slowly due to the Hubble friction with the Hubble expansion, and it decays with the scaling of a to the minus 3. So this is exactly the energy density scaling of like pressureless matter in the universe. Okay? So this is the circumstance in which a scalar, a scalar field oscillating around the minimum of its potential in the late universe redshifts like cold dark matter. Okay, so theta naught was our uh, was our misalignment parameter, but actually the way that I've written it here, it's not dimensionless. <laughs> so if I want it to be a misalignment angle, not a misalignment parameter, it's convenient to factor out uh, fa. So then this theta, the coefficient of fa here, is just a dimensionless angle that can take values between 0 and pi. So the initial energy density stored in the field at the start of oscillations is then just given by a half ma squared times fa squared times theta squared. And we know that ma times fa is just set by the QCD scale, if this is the QCD axion. So the energy density stored in the field is basically just controlled by, by, um, by theta, by this misalignment angle. And the late time energy density is going to be set by um, how much it has redshifted since the field started oscillating. Recall that these oscillations began when um, you know, they, they began when MA was comparable to H. So the late time density is just going to be set by the initial energy density stored in the field and how long it's been oscillating. Now for the QCD axion, you need to be a little bit careful about this because MA, well, Prior to the QCD phase transition, the, the, uh, prior to the hadronization phase transition, there aren't any pions in the universe. They're not an appropriate degree of freedom. The pion mass is zero. So the axion mass, likewise, also switches on during the QCD phase transition. So there, the MA is actually time dependent. These oscillations begin uh, at the time of the QCD phase transition, and you need to do this calculation a bit carefully. Um, OK, before I say a little bit about that, let me just say a bit about what we might expect the missile, what value we might expect this misalignment angle to take. Because, I mean, this calculation, you need to be a bit careful, but at least at this level, when you're just thinking about the uniform axion field, it is a completely doable calculation. So before we launch into that, let's just say a bit what value we might expect this misalignment angle to take. 
Now, so the answer here is going to depend on whether the misalignment angle is set before or after inflation. So if the axions are produced and the misalignment angle is set after inflation, then you know, th then you know, different patches of the cosmos that are causally disconnected from each other, we would expect them to have different values of the misalignment angle if it's just if it's just some random some random uh, population of the of the field at different points. Then, as the universe expands and our causal volume increases, you know, we get to see more and more of the universe as it expands after inflation. We would expect the um, aver the average value of the misalignment angle within our observable universe to be the average over many such patches. So in that case, if we essentially just sort of populate this misalignment angle theta to have all values between zero and pi randomly, or between you know minus pi over two and pi over two, if you want to frame it that way randomly, then um, we we expect a sort of order one value for the misalignment angle on average. However, if the misalignment angle is set in patches before inflation, then inflation will expand one of those pre-inflation causal volumes to cover our whole observable universe and much more. So in that case, we would expect everywhere in our Hubble volume to have the same misalignment angle. And the question is just, well, what, what should that angle be? On general principles, you might expect it to be order one, but there's nothing wrong in principle with having um, a tiny misalignment, with, with us happening to be in a volume that had a tiny misalignment angle at early times. Now, this now gets into questions of, okay, do we have an anthropic argument that we need a tiny misalignment angle such that our volume would um, you know, look like the universe that we see today and be something capable of supporting intelligent life? I'm, I'm going to leave that argument aside for the moment, but just say that in this context where the axion with the misalignment angles get set prior to inflation, people are generally happy to allow for very tiny misalignment angles if necessary to get the right amount of dark matter. Okay. I will also say that there are actually pretty stringent constraints on scenarios where the axion is um, all the dark matter and the energy scale of inflation is high. So this is now the inverse axion coupling on the y-axis and the scale of inflation on the x-axis. And there's a significant chunk of this parameter space that can be ruled out because um, the axions would source isocurvature fluctuations coming out of inflation. So if we learn more about inflation, if we observe tensor modes, for example, that might tell us about axio that might tell us something about how axions behave. If we um, detect axions, that will give us some information about the scale of inflation. Th this was written in the context. This this uh, plot comes from a paper that was written in the context when, but we thought biceps or B modes back in uh, back in 2014, and what it could potentially have told us about theories with axions in them. Okay. So let's now get back to that calculation that I told you that is doable and you just have to be a bit careful in the QCD axion case to take into account the time dependent QCD axion mass. So in the case with a uniform theta everywhere, so theta set before inflation everywhere in our volume has the same value of theta, then we can evaluate the critical density in, uh, in axions and we get a result that, that looks like this. And, and again, getting, getting this power right is, is a little non-trivial. So what you find is that the uh, density of axions in the late universe is scales like the misalignment angle squared, as we might have expected, and it has uh, some dependence on the axion mass as well. So what we see is that as we make MA, um, as we make MA smaller and smaller, naively, this omega axions is going to get very large, so we need theta to be very small to compensate for that. So very light DM can require very small values of theta, which may require some kind of, which typically requires pre-inflation production and um, may require some um, anthropic argument to support it. So on the other hand, theta squared I mean, we, it can't really be larger than order 10. It's restricted to being between 0 and pi. So, that make, so this mechanism requires, if this is how you get the dark matter, MA should be at the sort of sub-milli EV scale. So it sets an upper bound on the mass that you can have. OK, so that's the relatively easy, although a bit subtle, version of the calculation. The hard version of the calculation is that if the uh, axial misalignment angle is set after inflation, then we have different domains through the universe that have all different values of theta. And that means that you can build sort of a network of axion strings and domain walls in the early universe. After the QCD phase transition, that topological configuration will decay away. When it decays, it produces more axions. That calculation is really numerically tricky, and people have been working on trying to get it right for several decades that I know about. 
Um, there have been some there have been some recent papers that try to do a better job of this calculation. So let me just talk. I'm not an expert on the on these calculations, so let me just give you some limits. If the contribution from this network is totally negligible, and you just say, okay, you know, I, I don't care, contribution from axion strings is negligible. In this case, our effective theta squared is an ensemble average over a large number of domains, so we know what its value is. Then in that case, the favored QCD axion mass would be about 25 micro EV. Okay, so there we would have a sharp target. So then the question is, okay, uh, but what happens to the axion string network? How many axions do we get from decay of this complicated topological configuration? In that case, this 25 micro EV thing is just a lower bound for the post-inflation case. And uh, I, you know, I, I said that it should be below the milli EV scale. So different simulations have found different levels of contributions from the string network resulting in preferred masses that go from this lower bound up to about 500 micro EV. So the uncertainty here is more than an order of magnitude. This is one example of a recent set of simulations using adaptive mesh refinement to try to cover the like large range of scales that you need to think about from the horizon scale all the way down to scales of the smallest axion strings. They find a preferred mass scale somewhere between 40 and 180 micro EV. Um, however, this is, you know, so I think this is a nice paper, but this is also a problem that people have been working on for a long time and the numbers have moved around a bit. So I would not take this as gospel, but it's an interesting guideline. All right, so, so this sort of gives us a picture for what kinds of QCD axions could work as cold dark matter. Uh, they, should be, they should have masses less than the milli EV scale, but potentially extending down to very low masses if, we're, um, if we allow the misalignment angle to be tiny in the early universe. If the axions are produced post-inflation, there's a narrower range between you know tens of micro EV and hundreds of micro EV that could potentially give you the right abundance. If they're produced pre-inflation, then there's there's a lot of space open. Okay. So if this stuff was really the dark matter, how would we look for it? So most axion searches rely on the idea that in the presence of the magnetic field, an axion can turn into a photon, or vice versa. So that we have a vertex that looks like this: axion, photon, external B field. Um, just again, just coming from an interaction of this form in the Lagrangian. So that means that photons can convert into axions and then back. Um, that means that you know, if I'm trying to shine a photon through a region that would normally be opaque to it, whether that's a wall or a large chunk of the universe, then at conversion into axions can potentially let the photons traverse those regions. It also means that if there are dark matter axions out there in the presence of a magnetic field, they could turn into photons, which we could see. So most searches rely on this mechanism one way or another. There are some searches that don't. Axions and axion-like particles could also induce nuclear electric dipole moments, um, or they can do things like modify the proton-neutron mass splitting, which could have interesting consequences in nucleosynthesis, although the default QCD axion, the effect on nucleosynthesis is too small um, to be observed. But most searches rely on the, put on the putative coupling of photons. Here are a bunch of examples of things that you can do with that coupling. High energy photons traveling from very high redshifts would normally experience an opaque universe because they can pair produce on the extragalactic background light. Um, but if they can convert into axions for part of their travel, travel to us and then convert back into photons in our galaxy, that could explain the observation of very high energy photons from, di from distant sources. And this has been suggested as a mechanism to explain some apparent very high energy photons from a recent bright gamma ray burst, although it's still not totally clear if the photons are in fact associated with the burst. There is a whole ensemble of light shining through a wall experiments, which um, in stellar cooling, axions can escape from stars more easily than photons can. In scenarios where you would normally expect photons produced by the star to be trapped within the star, if they can turn into axions, they can get out, and that can, um, that can modify the cooling of the stars. Photons passing through galactic or cluster scale magnetic fields can also be distorted in intensity or polarization due to such conversions, because some of them have turned into axions along the way. In the second category where we, so none of these actually depend on the axion being the dark matter. All of these just depend on the axion existing as a state in the spectrum. The second class of searches which look for axion dark matter, uh, you know, you try to take the axion dark matter in the halo and turn them into something that you can see. 
Um, so the CAST experiment uses the magnetic field of the sun and searches for X-ray photons made from axion conversion. You can look for radio emission coming out of neutron star magnetospheres. These have intense magnetic fields, and as um, dark matter axions pass through them, they could convert into photons. There's a neat uh, mechanism that I learned about when one of my students wrote a paper on it earlier this year, which is that if you have an intense source of photons, it can actually cause stimulated decay of the axion dark matter in the halo, and so that can potentially give you a signal. And so, so there are lots of interesting things that you can do with axion photon conversion. The sort of c there are two, there, there's a, a large number of direct axion search experiments. The two, the flagship experiment for a long time has been ADMX, the axion dark matter experiment, where the idea of this is to build a resonant microwave cavity containing a strong magnetic field and measure the output p power from the cavity as you scan the resonant frequency. So the axion photon conversion will occur and will be enhanced when the frequency um, when the frequency of the cavity matches with the axion energy, which is largely just determined by the axion mass, since dark matter axions are very cold and non-relativistic. So you vary the frequency of the cavity, and you look for a bump in the power. So this is the kind of signal that, that they would be looking to see, um, a, a narrow bump in the power coming out of the cavity due to, um, due to axion photon conversion, due to the dark matter axions turning, uh, turning into photons in the cavity B field. So the ADMX collaboration has currently tested the QCD axion in a mass range ranging from about 2.6 uh, micro EV up to 4.2 micro EV in several runs uh, over the years because you, you need to scan quite slowly because the width of the resonance is expected to be pretty small. So okay, so that's that's that that's ADMX. Uh, ADMX has a next stage ADMX EFR, which is going to try to scan a much wider range of the axion parameter space. Another, um, cat, another experiment, uh, DM radio, which is the other flagship experiment suggested to probe the QCD axion by a recent dark matter new initiatives pro program in the US, is to say, all right, look, if we're really talking about ultralight axions, then their wavelength is much larger than the size of the experiments that we could potentially build. If that's true, we can treat the axion field as basically constant over the source of our experiment, and we can write down, you know, we, we can write down as coupling to the photon, and we can see that this approximately uniform axion field basically acts like an extra source term in Maxwell's equations. So this is what the modification of Maxwell's equations look like. So you get these extra terms uh, in the curl of the B field coming from the gradient of the axion field and the time dependence of the axion field. And we typically make the assumption, if analysis of these experiments typically makes the assumption that we can drop the first term. Um, and also ignores effects like, um, yeah, also ignores some effects like displacement current sourced from the variation of the axion field. This source term leads to effectively a small, this means that the time oscillation of the axion, this second term, effectively induces a small oscillating effect of current, which in turn sources a small oscillating magnetic field. Now you can amplify this by coupling it into an LC circuit. Experiments like this are sometimes called lumped element detectors because they rely on basically being, a, well, the usual analysis relies on basically being able to model the system as a set of discrete circuit elements. Um, again, like in the case of ADMX, you, you take, you, um, th this LC circuit has a resonant frequency. You want to tune that resonant frequency to near the axion mass. Uh, if the resonant frequency lines up with the axion mass, you'll get a big enhancement of the current. And, and, you, and you look for that as you scan the resonant frequency of the circuit. So uh, there's, there's actually an interesting paper that came out recently by uh, one of the postdocs at MIT, Josh Foster, about the validity of the magneto-quasi-static approximation, which is typically used here to significantly simplify Maxwell's equations. It's, uh, th there are cases where we thought the approximation works and it doesn't, but there are also cases where you know, it works better than you might naively have expected. So, okay, so with these strategies, with ADMX EFR and with this DM radio strategy, which is especially good for very light axion dark matter, this is what we expect to be able to do for the QCD axion. So here, the y-axis here is the coupling to photons. So this is 1 over F, one of what we've been calling our 1 over FA, uh, multiplied by just a prefactor describing the coupling to photons. And the axion mass is on the, y is on the um, x-axis. So we can see this is the EV scale up here. This is sort of the milli EV scale, uh, which I would expect QCD axions to start being a to start being a good candidate for cold dark matter. 
and this yellow band corresponds to the the Q, corresponds to the QCD axion. The width of this band just as as we said, it's really the coupling to the gluons that's controlled by the strong CP problem. So the coupling to the photons is somewhat model dependent and is supposed to be captured by the width of this band. Um, so the gray regions are what's currently ruled out. This gray band that comes down to this yellow QCD axion band is the current ADMX detection. This red region is what the next generation of ADMX and the um, and DM radio meter cubed would. So DM and I here stands for Dark Matter New Initiatives, which was a program in which uh, ADMX EFR and um, DM radio meter cubed were proposed. They would be able to prove the QCD axion from around the um, 0.1 micro EV scale up to, uh, so this is about uh, 10 to the minus four EV. So this is sort of the hundreds of micro EV scale. The blue region is what you might be able to get to if these experiments work and go to plan with at the low end, this is mostly a significantly scaled up version of DM radio. At the high end, there's a whole ensemble of other strategies to try to get to the QCD axion. It's also worth noting, you know, you might say, okay, why, why is the plot drawn like this? If we just want to go after the QCD axion, you know, what, what's all this other space? So the rest of the space is often called axion-like particles, by which we mean essentially a pseudoscalar that has a coupling to the standard model photon that works like the axion, but is not necessarily connected to the strong CP problem. And this lower panel here is just showing, as I mentioned, the, the different ideas for searching for, for searching for axions at different mass scales. So this is DM radio and ADMX uh, in the next generation of experiments. And then going forward, there's um, D DM radio gut, which is trying to get to lower masses. And uh, going, yeah, I guess it's a little blurry. Go going up to higher energies, you have a large range of technologies such as Haystack, Mad Max, Alpha, um, and then at, at even higher masses, things like EAXO, which is the, which is the uh, upgrade to cast that I mentioned, looking for axions from X-ray convert, looking at X-rays from axion conversion in the solar magnetic field. There is also this nice website, which you can go to whenever you want to look at updated limits and projections and axion searches. I guess I just also say that Light bosonic dark matter is a pretty plausible possibility whether or not it relates to the strong CP problem. As we've said, there's an enormous possible mass range. The scalar and vector portals that we discussed earlier could apply to the dark matter candidate directly as opposed to mediators, so long as the dark matter is long lived enough. If the dark matter is sufficiently light, its natural decay time scale can be really, really long. And so um, ultralight scalars or vectors can be great dark matter candidates. They can be produced through the kind of misalignment mechanism that we talked about for the axion. Um, you can have other production mechanisms as well, such as heavier states decaying to make these particles, um, topological configurations like the axion string network decaying to make these particles, as well as production during inflation. So there's a wide range of precision tests with sensitivity to such particles. I'm basically just going to flash the plot, which is all the different ways that you can look for ultralight particles with some tiny coupling to the photons, from interferometry to atomic and molecular and nuclear clocks, to absorption experiments like the ones we talked about in direct detection at the higher mass range, to like just tests for fifth forces um, with, 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 with a range of studies. And there are also cosmic bounds. So that's another, the QCD axion is kind of the first target in this space because it has this nice theoretical motivation from the strong CP problem. Um, it's far from the last target. And I'll just wrap up there. Thank Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Tracy, for the four uh, wonderful lectures. Uh, two questions. Hi, thanks for a very interesting lecture. Um, I had a question um, about uh, actions during inflation, because yep. uh, since uh, like seven years ago or so, people have been doing this uh, action like particles in monodromy-like potentials mm -hmm. to solve uh, Higgs hierarchy problems and so on. Yeah. Like intuitively for what you said, I understand that this action or action-like particle cannot be the dark matter action because it could be stuck in a minimum during inflation and therefore have no misalignment. But if you tell me otherwise, I'll be very happy, so. Uh, let me, uh, good. So I'm, I'm aware of these scenarios, but I'm not an expert on them. My 
naive understanding is that, yeah, it's hard to make it be the dark matter. But let me look into this a bit and get, can you ping me on Slack? Just just yeah, sure. like shoot me a DM on Slack. Sure. I will uh, dig into the, because you know, I don't want to say that nobody has come up with a way to make it act like the dark matter when that, that that's a strong statement. Okay. Thanks very much. And of course, if someone in the room knows better and is an expert on this stuff, you should feel free to speak up on, on that front. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Just a rather simple question. Yeah. Are the minima and the cosine potential of the axion broken by quantum effects, or do we need another mechanism for this? Um, sorry, sorry, you want to, um, you, you're just asking like how you get the potential in the Th first place? There's an infinite or? amount of degenerate minima now, and yeah. how do we end up in the zero? So, um, I think there, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, I'll say that a lot of the treatment that I had here is a sort of like a, a, assumes, a, assumes an expansion around zero. Like, it, I think it should, like, I mean, the axion, yeah, so th this, this, may, this may be another one that I say, you know, me on slide because I because this can be a little subtle and I want to make sure that I don't mess it up but um, yeah um, because yeah I, I I'm act I'm act sorry okay I guess what I'll say is I think that the the way that we typically define the axion field like it is it is act Okay, what I was going to say was like it, it, it is actually periodic and being in one of the other minima may, may be okay for you, but it's also true that a lot of the stuff that I was doing here sort of is, is basically expanding around that zero minima. So um, there is a, I mean, you can get, you can I think get quantum corrections to this axion potential which change the shape. The quest, there is a, there is a generic, yeah, I mean, and there is a generic question about like how large those corrections can be and can you quantitatively change, can you qualitatively change the picture that I've talked about? But I've looked this up before, but I don't have the answer to hand at the moment. So uh, ping me on Slack and I'll follow up on that question. Okay, another question here. Thank you. Yep. I also have a question regarding action during inflation. Yeah. So you showed the, the constraint coming from uh, isocurvature of like two perturbations. Yeah. Uh, can you explain me what is the like where um, where do this constraint come from? What is the observable that constraint them? Right. So I mean the 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 observable would be um, I mean the observable would be isocurvature perturbations. So like non adiabatic modes in the in the CMB at late times. Let me, so I, I will also say like, I, I don't actually work on axions myself and this is not you know, an, an area that, that I'm a particular expert in. But so, yeah, so I mean, I, I guess I'll just, I, as I understand is basically what gives you isocurvature perturbations is where you have sort of an alternative clock, uh, sort of like a, a second clock field uh, in addition to just the inflaton. The axions can provide a field like that, they can generate isocurvature perturbations. We have pretty stringent constraints on isocurvature perturbations, I think primarily from the CMB. Okay, so, thank yeah, you. That's yeah, my question was, <laughs> I don't know uh, what, like, uh, what do isocurvature fluctuations, uh, like the impact on that on CMB, but uh, uh, no problem. L let me, yeah, yeah, l no problem. I, I, I can send you some references. <laughs> One more question. All right, hi. So maybe I missed it or I didn't understand. Yeah. Because, uh, we have the action or matter, well, the action become colder matter through the misalignment mechanism, but how do we produce the actions in the first place? Like, um, by, like how do we, uh, like, like just why, why is the misalignment angle non-zero to begin with? No, no, no. My question is like, in the how are actions produced in the, like in the beginning and then they become colder matter. So if it is thermal production and then they be they just no, it's oscillate. not. It's not thermal production. It's I guess just that. Right. So you're just asking like how does this? 
how like why why does I mean so you should think of this effectively as a scale as a you should think of the axion effectively as like a scalar field pervading the universe. You should think you can think of the zero mode of the axion as, as being basically like a classical scalar field. Um, so the question of like how so right um, I, I just trying to think of the the best way to say this so. I guess I would say that the way, if you start from a top-down perspective and ask like where where does this field come from, it can be associated with the yeah I'm just it, it's it's a, it's typically associated with the with some kind of global symmetry in the standard model, which is called Peche Quinn symmetry, when the pet the Breaking of the Pechi Quinn symmetry is what sets your misalignment angle in the first place. The fact that you know the field, like the the and because uh, I mean to me I guess, like I mean this field could have th this field could have a value of zero, <laughs> but it doesn't in principle. The, but, but I mean it doesn't in principle. The fact that it, the what gets you that non-zero value, which in the early universe isn't associated with any extra energy density, is is just like a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now, what turns that into what turns that into energy is the presence of the um, is is the presence of the axion potential, right? Which is a result of the which is a result of the, for the QCD axion. Is a, is a result of the QCD phase transition that turns on the axion mass. So, like in in a sense, where it like where the energy for it like comes from. So I think you you can think of it as like coming from the coming from the structure of the QCD vacuum. That's my hand wavy answer. Okay, I have uh, maybe to wrap up a uh, simple question instead of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, in all these experiments, I mean, there are some scenarios, post-inflationary scenarios, for instance, where you expect the axion field to cluster, and to yep. form, to form like mini a mini cluster and so on. Yep. And also it goes also to other diametric candidates. No, <coughs> I mean, they are substructure. Mm -hmm. So how much uh, do, do this uh, direct detection experiment rely on the fact that we don't live in an underdensity of dark matter? Yeah, good. Uh, they're just like most of these are just like any other direct detection experiment. So if you live in an under density, it's bad for you. If you live in an over density, it's good. Uh, so yeah, if the if the dark if the axions are very uh, are like are very heavily clustered, like almost all of their abundance is tied up in mini clusters, then that puts you in a that will put you in a worse position for something like uh, ADMX or DM radio. You basically have to wait for one of the clusters to come through. Uh, if the um, now, for, for some other searches like axions encountering neutron star magnetospheres or something, mm. um, that I mean, it, it will it will reduce the rate of events. It may make the events more spectacular when it happens. For things like um, for, for things like you know emission of axions from like stimulated emission of photons from axions in the halo. There, you'll get to integrate along a pretty long line mm -hmm. of sight, which might have a lot of axion clumps in it. So I think, I think for the direct searches, it's it's probably not advantageous to you if the axion is very locked up in compact mm -hmm. objects, just because it dials down the rate. But for the more indirect and astrophysical searches, I, I think it's less obvious how okay. things will scale. Okay, thank you very much, Tracy. Thank um, much. Let's thank her for all the lectures. Thanks everyone. Well, yeah. yeah. And thanks everyone for all the good questions. And again, if you had a question that I didn't answer properly, ping me on Slack and I'll send you some references for it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And let's welcome Olga Mena to give the last lecture of the day.
Okay. So yesterday you if you remember we 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 were here right in the gravitational lensing part. So and I just uh, answer a question, but I didn't explain it properly. I mean, as in as in the cases of, of uh, gravitational lensing that I saw you yesterday, right? Also, CMB photons are subject to to CMB lensing, right? The CMB <coughs> photon path will be distorted by the presence of matter in homogeneities between us and the last scattering surface. Okay, so lensing what it does, it does produ it, 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 a, it produces a remapping of the of the fluctuations. Okay, and the uh, the, the, um, the deflection angle here, as you can see, is uh, oops, <laughs> well doesn't matter. It's it's proportional to the uh, to the gradient of the lensing potential. Okay, the lensing potential measures both the matter distribution and the geometry, okay? And the matter distribution is closely related to the power spectrum, okay? And as I told you yesterday, neutrinos are hot relics with very, very large thermal velocities. And therefore, they reduce cluster at a small scale. It's always the same, okay? Neutrinos reduce, uh, wash out small scale perturbations and then perturbations don't grow at small scales, okay? That's why we, we, we are measuring the neutrino mass from cosmology, okay? So here I show you, you cannot see really well, but the, the lensing potential, how does it change? Okay, let me see if I can, okay. That's, let me go back one second. Uh, sorry, I apologize again. So I mean, this is a, um, a plot of the angular power spectrum of the lensing potential, okay? And you can see how it decreases here, this curve here, let me see if I can, as the, as the neutrino mass increases, okay? So maybe this is more clear in the plot I showed yesterday from the Planck collaboration in 2013, 2014 was published, in which you can notice that the power, the, the, the lensing power spectrum, right, angular power spectrum, decreases as the neutrino mass increases, okay? So this is how do we know of, uh, of the neutrino mass from CMB, okay? So from Planck, uh, pol uh, temperature polarization and lensing measurements, we know today that the neutrino mass should be, the mass, the, the sum of the three neutrinos, okay, should be smaller than 0.24 EV at 95% confidence level. To give you an idea, what does it mean? It means that 6 million neutrinos can weigh more than three electrons, okay? So imagine how light they are, okay? So uh, let's go now, let's continue. And I think that we are, you have seen this uh, in Mateo B.S. lectures. The, the, the largest impact of neutrino masses in any cosmological observable is that induced in, la, in the large scale structure of the universe, okay? Because neutrinos suppress structure formation on a scale larger than the free streaming scale when they turn non-relativistic, okay? Neutrinos with EV or sub EV masses are hot thermal relics with large velocities. Cold dark matter instead has zero velocity and, and can cluster at any scale. Let me show you this. So this is a sketch that, uh, where I saw here at the perturbation, right? And the, the neutrinos and the cold dark matter particles. So if the wavelength of the perturbation is smaller than the free streaming scale, of course, neutrinos won't cluster, okay? Won't contribute to clustering. If instead the opposite is satisfied, okay, neutrinos will cluster, okay? So here I show you a movie in which, uh, courtesy from, from uh, uh, Francisco Villescusa Navarro, in which you can see the difference, right, between hot dark matter, here, neutrinos, dark, uh, uh, cold dark matter, okay, oops, ah, I don't know why, I'm, or when I want to, to put the, the laser, I always do. Okay, so, hot dark matter, cold dark matter, and together. You can see that the structure here at the small scales in this red uh, uh, area is much, much, much smaller at, at small scales than in the blue uh, simulation, okay? So it's like if you have been like erasing this, this, this small scale fluctuations, okay? This is the effect. You can really compare, if you compare this to this, and this is if we put it together, okay? So um, what is this famous free streaming scale? It's super simple. I mean, it's really simple. As, I mean, a high school student, smart enough, would know how to compute that, okay? So, I mean, if you consider the growth equation for a single uh, couple, uh, uh, uncoupled fluid, sorry, for a single uncoupled fluid in the linear regime, with constant sound speed, you will have this second order differential equation in which we have the Hubble drag, okay, 
which of course opposes clamping, right? We have pressure, and then we have gravity in this side, okay, in the, in the, in the right hand side. So I mean, the gene scale is a scale here, a k here, a scale such that if k is larger than, k, than, than the gene scale, no growth can happen, okay? And if the opposite happens, structure grows, okay? This is just the, 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 the free slimming scale of the neutrino is just the, 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 I mean, this gene scale, but here replacing this CS square with sigma D square. And now, this is one exercise, so if you have a camera, take a picture now, okay? So, <laughs> okay, you will have to compute this free streaming scale, okay? But, I mean, okay, it's not, it's not that difficult. I mean, it's not a three-loop calculation, okay? So, I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's simple, and if not, we will help you. Okay, so here I show you the matter power suppression induced by neutrino masses. So, I'm going to increase now the fraction of neutrino mass, right? Uh, um, and you can see, right? The suppression is huge, right? And in the linear regime, it's proportional to the fraction of dark matter in the form of neutrinos. In the linear regime, where everything is wonderful and perfect, and I'm very happy because I can compute everything with a pencil and, you know, I mean, so, so in the linear regime, okay? However, uh, this notice that this suppression is much larger than the one induced in the CMB. You remember, right, that in the ISW effect, the suppression was 10% for one EV. Neutrino. Here, the suppression is huge. It's 100% for one EV neutrino. That's why we need to measure galaxies and, and quasars and large scale structure to extract the neutrino mass, okay? Of course, things are not as beautiful as I said, right? I mean, so, because, of course, there are non-linearities, as you know, right? I mean, in theory, at some point, at some, there is some scale here at which, uh, uh, here, right, at which linear theory is not is no longer uh, valid, and then we have to face uh, nonlinearities, right, and uh, more more complicated calculations or simulations. Okay, here you can see, right, the difference between the linear and nonlinear uh, power spectrum, and you can see that starts to be important at some scale. So also realize that we are not measuring dark matter. <laughs> we are measuring galaxies. Okay, many of you know much better than I do, right? So, I mean, galaxies are biased, uh, biased tracers of the underlying dark matter field, okay? Of the, that, uh, of the dark matter density field, okay? So, we have this bias here when we are measuring the, the galaxy, galaxy power spectrum. Mm. So, this is already one problem, right? One big problem, because, I mean, we need to know this bias. Well, maybe observing different tracers, right? Not focusing just in one type of galaxies. Maybe we can solve this. Yes, but neutrinos themselves induce a scale-dependent bias, right? Because, I mean, as, as, I have shown, as I have shown you, they, they reduce the matter power spectrum at small scales. So it's a reduction of the matter power spectrum, which depends on the scale. So, I mean, it's kind of difficult to extract purely the, 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 the neutrino mass. Yesterday I was talking to someone that, who is going to work on uh, neutrino bias with Raúl Angulo. I don't, know, uh, I don't know if... Well, anyways, I don't know if he's around, but okay. So, uh, uh, you know, I mean, so it's important, right, to understand the, the, the galaxy bias because otherwise we are not able to measure the neutrino mass, right? It's the generate, right, somehow. So, I mean, if you assume a bias which is constant, you were saying, right, that you are going to work on neutrino. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, I was. So that's why it's so important to understand galaxy bias, okay? Because for physics, it's crucial, right? I mean, for, for, for extracting, for instance, the neutrino mass is crucial, okay? So um, fortunately, there are the, va the varying acoustic oscillations uh, signature, right? In which instead of, in, 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 instead of, uh, um, interpreting, let me, uh, let me put it this way, galaxy clustering in its, in its shape form, in its matter power spectrum form, we are extracting this info in the form of varying acoustic oscillations. I'm sure Matteo talked about this, right? So I'm going to talk uh, uh, faster, right? So I mean, everything, as you have seen in many lectures, not only mine, also in Tracy's, in Matteo's, in many, everything in the universe is a competition between pressure and gravity, okay? So photons and baryons are tightly coupled, right? And they, uh, and they are resembling acoustic waves, okay? And, uh, I mean, it's like uh, in the baryon photon fluid, there is a competition between pressure and, and gravity. And we have here the matter over density delta here, right? Okay, so the time when, when, when baryons are released, right, 
from the drag of photons is known at, at, at the drag epoch. At this time, photons freeze, right? Uh, sorry, photons expand, sorry, and baryons freeze at a scale that is this, uh, this typical scale. You can see this in this movie, in this animation, right? So, I mean, that is given is, 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 the, is the maximum distance a sound wave can travel in the early universe since the, since the beginning of the universe until this drag epoch, okay? And this, right, is a physical distance, right? I mean, so this scale is what we are going to measure with baryon acoustic oscillations. So let me put you a, 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 another movie, okay, from Daniel Einstein and Martin White. You can see here different perturbations. At the very beginning, all of them are together. Dark matter, gas, photons, and neutrinos. Gas I, is, is are variants, obviously, right? So, I mean, time starts, receive starts. At some point, dark matter remains, right, in the over density. And then at some point, you see, right, the variants accumulate here at a distance of roughly 150 megaparsecs, okay? And this distance has been measured really, really accurately well, okay? So this means that there should be a small excess in the two-point galaxy correlation function around 150 megaparsecs. Given a galaxy, there should be some sort of excess at this distance, okay? So in the 80s, well, let's measure it. No way. I mean, the size of the other survey is the size of the VO scale. Where you cannot measure any over density because your survey is done. And in 2005, great, very good. We have a big, 2000, sorry, we have a big number at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, but this volume is very small. 2005, we have already a big volume, and it's the first detection of the VO signature. Uh, SDSS3 me has measured it with eight sigma. DS with two sigma, you can see here, right? Right? I mean, this is the 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 this, uh, the, the pi uh, the the pi chart from 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 uh, SDSS4. So I mean. Um, SDSS3, sorry, SDSS4, I will so, uh, show you in, in a couple of slides. So large scale structure measurements can be interpreted either in the geometrical form or in the shape form. Geometrical, I mean bio, okay? So when you measure the, the uh, galaxies, right, you can either interpret this information in the, in the shape form or in the baryon acoustic oscillation form. Of course, one is the Fourier transform of the other, right? And here I show you. Uh, let me see, so the, one is the Fourier transform of the, of the other. And here I show you the effect of neutrino masses, both in the, in the, in the bio signature and both in the matter power spectrum, okay? But it's, we have shown, right, uh, with some collaborators, that the bio of information is more powerful, right? And you can see here that the, the, this, is, this, this is the one, uh, one dimension probability uh, posterior on the mass of the neutrino. And you should compare here. The, the, the solid lines with the dashed lines, which correspond to a given data set. So the solid lines are when you are looking into galaxies in this way. And the dashed lines when you are looking into galaxies into this way. You can see always that the limits on the neutrino mass are always better when we interpret the galaxy information in the form of baryon acoustic oscillation. Because it's less subject to these nonlinearities and these biases. Okay? So to what does it mean? Okay, so we have here the sum of the neutrino masses versus the mass of the lightest uh, mass eigenstate that could be even zero, okay? For, and these are the predictions from uh, neutrino oscillations for the normal and inverted hierarchy. So from the 0 0.24 EV, if we add large scale structure, we go to 0.12 EV. And if we also add supernovae, we go down to 0.11 EV. Imagine, 0.11 EV. So we are really, 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 really close. But now we have even more good news. This is a plot, of, uh, well, I mean, this, these are the, the galaxies and different, different galaxies and different uh, uh, tracers measured by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey 4 in, in 2000, uh, up to 2020. So you can see that we have BOS uh, uh, plus EBOS Lyman Alpha uh, tracers, quasars from EBOS, uh, emission la, uh, line galaxies, uh, luminous red galaxies from EBOS and BOS, luminous red galaxies and bright galaxies from Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So, I mean, we have observed really, really a huge number of tracers, okay? 
uh, really, really. I, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but the number of traces is amazing. It's about two million. I mean, so it's amazing. So these numbers, and this is the sky, uh, the, the, the sky uh, coverage, right? I mean, the, the footprint, right? Uh, the sky footprint from this, from Bos and Ibos. And as you can see, at some point, we will cover all the sky. So what do we do then? I will tell you now what we are. What are you gonna do? Because when we will cover the sky, I'm not gonna do anything. I can tell you. I will do pies for my for for my grandchildren if I have them. So, okay. So don't count on me. <laughs> so here I show you right the varying acoustic oscillations measured by these different tracers. Okay. So we have luminous red galaxies, emission line galaxies, quasi-stellar objects. Oops, sorry. How, how have we measured this, uh, this, uh, this um, baryon acoustic oscillation, right? I mean, here I show you the matter power spectrum, but the, the, you have seen the, the, the peak in the two correlation function in the previous slide, okay? So, I mean, and here I show you the constraints on F sigma 8, that, as you know, is, is, is a measure of the clustering. It's the growth factor times the clustering, okay? This mysterious parameter sigma 8, right? That there is a small tension between... Um, Planck and Wiglens in data, and you can see the, the how we can constrain now. Oh, my God, I mean, how can we constrain the predictions from, for instance, bien, okay, <laughs> this does not like it. How can we constrain? How can we constrain the, uh, the um, a, a, a universe with a neutrino mass? No, no problem. Here, here, here. Okay, so we can see, right? That data really deviates from that, you know. So I mean. Anyways, so if we assume this data, we go down to a limit that is 0.09 EV, okay? And it's not that me and my collaborators also uh, only said this. I mean, also another one said that. So, I mean, we are not wrong, okay? So, this means that 6 million neutrinos can weigh more than one electron, okay? Imagine, 6 million neutrinos are, are lighter than one electron, okay? So... You will tell me, yeah, come on, I mean, but I don't trust you. You change something and then your limit goes like crazy. No, no way. I mean, these limits are really robust in the sense that they are really difficult to avoid in minimal extensions of the lambda CDM picture, okay? And with minimal, what I mean, for instance, this 0.09 EV, right? Let me see what I mean with minimal, goes only up to 0.95 EV if I add an effective as a free parameter. So, not bad. Even if I had a curvature and an equation of a state for the dark energy component different from minus one, I will get a limit of 0.14 EV, okay? So these limits are robust. It's not that you change a parameter and they disappear. No, 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 no. They are robust. They are really robust. And to change them, what, what one needs to do is either go to non-standard non gravity, okay, modify gravity models, or to models in which neutrinos behave more we, uh, in a weird way, let's say. They have extra interactions, exotic interactions, and so on and so, and so forth. But let me go even further. I mean, if, you, if we assume that the dark energy is not a cosmological constant, but is a fluid with an equation of a state larger than minus one, that is a physical, in the physical regime, quintessence, let's say, right? With W larger than minus one, because W larger than minus, W smaller than minus one is something weird. I mean, it's, uh, it's this phantom thing. So if we assume something really physical, we get a limit of 0.08 EV. So cosmology is really, really getting to the 0.06 minimum neutrino mass that, um, uh, that, that is uh, predicted by neutrino oscillation experiments. So at some point, cosmology should see a signal, okay? Should see a signal, and if it does not see it, we have a problem, or not. I don't mean, okay, okay, I mean, maybe, maybe we don't have a problem and it's better. <laughs> so, I mean, there are also limits without CMB, okay? Only with, 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 with large-scale structure. If we take, for instance, Lyman alpha, data and also a, 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 a large scale from uh, BO measurements and uh, from emission line galaxies and, and, BB, and a BBM bound, we get a limit of 0.63 B, which is not that bad. Realize that we are neglecting all CMB data in this limit. So, I mean, it's good. I mean, 0.63 without CMB data is, a, is an excellent limit in the neutrino mass. It's much better than whatever we have from any other prof, terrestrial prof, I mean, right? So, here I show you again uh, the current limits on neutrino masses from cosmology, okay, together with other bounds. 
So I mean, I saw you here in the plane of, uh, of the neutrino mass, right? Here, sorry, here, versus the mass of the lightest neutrino, versus the mass of the, of the, of the measured by tritium uh, beta decay experiments, as the Katrin experiment in Calrue, and also by measurements of the uh, neutrino less double beta decay experiments, which look for this, uh, uh, for this, uh, this rare decay, nuclear decay, okay? So I mean, and the predictions for normal and inverted ordering for in, in, each, in, each, in each plane, okay? You can see that cosmology is really reaching a very, very interesting limit. And we are doing this with this past and future, uh, sorry, past and ongoing uh, uh, footprint, okay? Here I show you the footprint from uh, Wiggle C, um, uh, DS, BOS, EBOS. So this is what we have observed so far in, the, in, in, in our sky, okay? But future is brilliant, okay? So we have Euclid, we have that will cover, will add this, we will have DESI, or we have already, but I don't know what happened recently to DESI, that I mean, it was a disaster there, and I don't know if it was a fire or something like this. Someone told me, no? Okay, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the fire is already gone. <laughs> Someone told me something about DESI, but I mean, it's, it's collecting data. It already saw its first light, so. And we have also the future LSST that will even add more into this sky footprint. And it's a point that we will have observed all, we, are, we will have covered all, 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 po all possible galaxies that we can observe, okay? Mm. With these future uh, devices, let's say, with these future experiments, right? Mm. So, I mean, future cosmological measurements are expected to achieve a two sigma measurement of the nutrient mass hierarchy between two and three sigma measurement of, neutrino, of both the nutrient mass hierarchy and of a, a two three sigma detection of the minimum neutrino mass detected by neutrino oscillation experiments, okay? Okay, so cosmology, if the neutrino masses are 0.06, in, uh, this is something that I will see in my lifetime, cosmology will really, should, will really see this, okay? If this is, if we are living in a, in a, in a, in a universe in which neutrinos behave as they should, or as, as we believe they are, they are, indeed, as they should, because we believe they do the, that way, so they should be, be, behave that way, okay? So cosmology will, 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 will measure the sum of the neutrino masses, the sum, and the hierarchy. But this is not the dream of the neutrino physicist. No, the dream of the neutrino physicist is not, not to know the sum. I mean, we don't know, want to want to know the sum of the neutrino, the, of the quark, or the um, quark masses. We want to know the individual, uh, neutrino masses, because that's how we will be able to really solve the puzzle that we have today in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in physics, right? In, 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 in particle physics, in the standard model, right? I mean, we don't know where these masses are coming from, whether the, 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 the mechanism responsible for, the, for, for neutrino masses is unknown, okay? So, I mean, we want to, 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 to build these models, we need to know the individual masses. And this, of course, I can show you, I show you here, M light, M medium, and M heavy, for the different orderings, I don't say one, two, and three, because one in the normal ordering is the lightest, while in the inverted ordering, the lightest is three. So I say light, medium, and heavy. And you see that with Desi and Planck, they overlap. There is no way, right, to distinguish among them, okay? So we don't need, we, we need to go down this, 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 uh, this error. Even future, uh, uh, Far further future experiments as Euclid and LSST or CMB stage four core whatever right won't we, that will achieve a precision on the neutrino mass of 0.01 eV won't be able won't be able to distinguish between the different neutrino mass eigenstates okay so how far can we get hmm. so we need to achieve a precision of 0.05 eV. 0.005 eV. And this, and in that way, the, the, you see, right, that we will have the light, the, the light, the medium, and the heavy really, really uh, divide, uh, really, really, uh, uh, ident we will be able to identify and to measure and the, to extract each of the neutrino masses separately, okay? I mean, another possible way, right, 
uh, would be if you measure the power spectrum, right? There will be a kink in the power spectrum associated to each of the neutrino masses, right? Let's say like this, right? I mean here, right? As p of k, right? Versus k, okay? But of course, this if is basically impossible to measure, okay? So, I mean, you need a precision for that. <laughs> that is far away, I mean, any... So, I mean, we need that precision. How can we reach that, okay? With 21 centimeter observations, okay? So, as I told you, at some point, you guys are gonna see that you don't have, you, you, that your job is done. You, ca you cannot observe more galaxies in the sky. What do you do? I mean, come with me and do pies. No, come on, I mean, no. Basically, because I'm super bad baking. So, I mean, <laughs> everything burns. So, <laughs> so, we should go to the 21 centimeter universe, okay, to look to the 21 centimeter line. So, here I show you, right? Well, this, 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 is, this plot is a bit unfair, eh? because this plot is SDSS, I mean, I don't know how, how many years ago. We have reached now up to C equal to, okay, so I mean, or right i mean so we will we, we should be to be fair we should feel this also right okay 21 centimeter cosmology is able to map most of the vis most of the universe right because it it measures well it relies on hydrogen hydrogen is the most abundant element in our universe right who knows who said who said that that hydrogen hydrogen was the the the, the, the most abundant uh, element in our universe who's who who's, it was a woman a scientist who, who discovered that? That hydrogen was the most abundant particle in the uh, uh, most abundant element in the universe. Cecilia, Cecil, uh, Cecilia Payne Gapochnik. Okay. Uh, she was. She was. I mean, uh, Cecilia was in the in the one of the of the of the Harvard uh, computers. Yeah, computer. And she and her thesis was uh, described as the most brilliant ever uh, most brilliant thesis ever written in in the in in, in astronomy at that until that time of course so she, she observing uh, 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 solar spectra she she, re, she she was the first one claiming that the composi the internal composition of the earth and the sun were completely different and moreover after she, she with her calculations she she discovered well that hydrogen was the most abundant uh, uh, element in, in our universe. So, anyways, so we are gonna uh, we are gonna at some point, right, uh, be able to measure the power spectrum of the 21 centimeters. So far, so we have only uh, upper bounds, okay. But um, what is the 21 centimeter? I mean, it's just uh, the hyperfine transition, right, in neutral hydrogen. This has been measured in laboratories, of course. But the, the, the aim is to measure it. At in, in our universe, okay? So the tracer is neutral hydrogen, and this this line can this 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 emission line can be, this this feature can be measured either in emission or in absorption, okay? And here you can see, here right we we have the dark ages, then the first galaxy form. We are start, and then we start. We can start observing this line. So I mean, realize that we can go up to ratios of 30 or so, okay? Of course. I mean, now foc most most of the of the of the of the surveys are focused in here, but the future SKA in principle should be able to go to very very high receipts, Okay, very very high. So here I show you a, a, a movie of the future uh, a, a square kilometer array. Okay, we'll have 2,000 high and mid frequency dishes plus a million low frequency antennas with an effective collective area of one kilometer square, okay? It's like if you would have an own one, one, one dish of one kilometer square, here is an animation or, or of how these, these antennas are gonna grow like this, like, no, of course, they are not gonna grow like this, but okay. <gasps> Uh, we, we hope it would be as easy, and uh, it's very nice because I mean they are they are gonna be uh, located, uh, for instance, in, in regions in which there are there are um, uh, uh, I mean there are traditional lands of 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 uh, tri of, mean, uh, of tribu of tribus uh, uh, indigenous 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 right, and then. We have to, I mean, they have to sign an agreement to respect their culture, even though they have to live with these antennas here, okay? But, but I mean, 
Okay, so, and, and the question is, why do we go there? I mean, why do we go to, to these places, right? To either Australia or this South, uh, South Africa, place, because they are the less populated places in the world, right? You cannot read this, but I mean, this, uh, these are the, less, the, people, the, the places with less population. The, the first one is Greenland. Oops, sorry. Oops. The first one is Greenland. Greenland. The second one are the Falkland Islands. The third one is Mongolia. So I mean, but we have there all these all these countries afterwards, right? Because if one puts uh, this radio, <laughs> these radio antennas in the middle of New York, I mean, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> okay, so one needs to go to very very uh, radio loud uh, uh, um, places, okay, areas. So I mean. This is something to practice. I know that you have been doing something with related to CAM with Mateo, right? CAM, you remember, right? You had an exercise of CAM with Mateo, no? No? Yes? Ah, okay. Yes, no? And what, what were you supposed to do to produce the matter power spectrum with CAM, no? And you had to install CAM, right? No? In your computer, right? And you had, some of you had some problems, no? I think installing CAM, no? Okay, so I mean, NASA has a, has a very nice web page. I want to show you here. Well, if, if I'm allowed to. Okay, so uh, let me go back. Okay, so uh, no, I want to. One second. Eh? So I want to go here. Okay, so I mean, there is a web page in which you already have. Okay, no. Sorry? Ah, very good. <laughs> uh, fantastic. I mean, this is great, so I'm not going to show you anything. Let me see if I can do it, because I want to go to the... Here there should be a, a link. Uh, no. Is it active in your PDF? Sorry? No, it's... it's, 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 it's oops. Here, is, there is this web page. I don't know why I cannot go to the web page. Exit the full, full screen mode and then click on the link. Probably. But then you cannot see my screen? No. Uh, si la mueves y la desplazas a la derecha, la tienes aquí. Esto, si le das aquí, te sale. Ah, pero esto no está activo, ¿no? Sí, sí. ¿Es this active? Sí, sí. Open okay, link. Open link. And now, yeah. is this here? And now, I probably have to move it here. Yeah, but then I cannot, yeah, but then I cannot, no, let, let me move it back, because yes, yes. then yeah. I want, I want to, because, <laughs> look, I mean, they have similar tools here. Let, let's do it like this, cam, okay? Like okay. this, okay? So, okay, if you can see this, right? You can do it directly from the web, right? You don't need to install it. So you click there, right? Oh, no, I don't know where I put it. Okay, but okay, you go there and you go down, and then you can put whatever ten uh, neutrino mass uh, age change as if as, as in the parents dot in of camp. You can do it online, and then you can click bo uh, bottom, and then all the data will be downloaded. Okay, it creates the data file, so you don't need really to 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 install camp, which in principle, it's not a pain, but lately everything is a pain, a pain because they change. First, from, I don't know, from to, I mean, in my case, I knew how to code perfectly Fortran. They, then I had to learn C. Then C++. Then, no, Python, no, 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 no. And thank God I learned Fortran, because I have a, a friend who just stopped in Mathematica. She says, okay, Mathematica is very, very long. It takes very, very long. But for, to me, it takes longer to write a code in Fortran. So, I mean, I don't care, right? I mean, you know, I mean, of course, the code will, will take running one hour but I, or, or one night. Keep running. But I take one minute to write it. Okay, Fortran, I take three nights in writing the code. And then, yes, it runs in one minute. So, I mean, you know, anyways. But this is very useful because you, you just click on Compute Power Spectrum and it does. You can do lensing or no lensing. You see here, right? Uh, uh, scalar, vector, tensor, whatever you want. Ah, it goes down. You see, great. You, you can do recombination by spectrum, um, tensor neutrinos, massive neutrino approximation. You can see, like, in the parents So, I mean, you don't need to do anything else, okay? Okay, so I will keep going now. Let me see if I can. No, it's not working. Mm. Now it's like frozen my computer. Very good. I mean, okay. I don't know what happened. Let me see. No. Uh. Technical problem, yeah, but I mean, the problem is that I'm in the presentation and I cannot. You see. Uh, uh, wait, because uh. 
Wait, because you're here now. It's fine, it's fine. Okay. We're back. Be <laughs> Great. Okay. So, yeah, perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was already sweating. Like, oh. Okay. So, uh, any questions so far for, for neutrino? For, for CM, uh, well, cosmic neutrinos, because now we are going to go to the high energy frontier. Okay? So we are going to move now to high energy neutrinos. So questions concerning neutrino mass or um, what I've said so far about, yeah? Or biases or? Yeah, well, uh, first one, the, uh, regarding the hierarchy, hierarchy, because, I mean, you mentioned that we could maybe measure it uh, in, uh, I don't know what, uh, like one to one centimeter or whatever, but I don't know, I don't understand very well what is the mechanism that makes you uh, be sensitive to that. Is like, I mean, I would guess, like, you are sensitive to the overall suppression in the power spectrum, but how do you know about the different masses? Okay, so what, what you are, what, how are you measuring the hierarchy from cosmology is how, how the bound goes down, okay? You are not really measuring the mass square differences, okay? So this is very important to understand. I mean, so um, what happens, right, is that you have a suppression of the power spectrum, right? So I mean, right? And the suppression increases, right, as you increase the neutrino mass, right? So I mean, so by measuring the power spectrum, okay, you are putting a limit on some m nu, okay? And we know that from, 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 from whatever, I mean, from oscillation probes, right, that the sum of the neutrino masses should be larger than a given quantity. So if you put a bound on this, right, if you put a bound on this, well, right, I mean, if you put a bound on this, you know if you are in the normal or in the inverted regimes, okay? I don't know if it's clear. Look, I mean, no, let me go but, uh, back here. Here, for instance, I, right? You see, right, that you have a prediction, right, for some m nu, depending on the normal or the inverted. And you are putting a limit on here, here, right? So, I mean, if you, let's see, if you measure, for instance, that some m nu is equal to, in cosmology, let's see, or is smaller than 0 0.06, well, not 6, okay, 07 EV and 95% confidence level, you are able to distinguish in cosmology the predictions from neutrino oscillation experiments, which are that in the normal ordering, some m nu should be smaller than 0 0.06 eV, and in the, in the inverted ordering, some m nu should be smaller than 0. Point, so, sorry, 0 0.1 eV. Okay, so, sorry. So, so basically, larger, larger. Basically, yes. because in the normal ordering, the, so you are changing the minimum. Uh, so the mass of the smallest one. Of the mass, oh, okay. of the lightest neutrino, exactly. Okay, okay. It's because in the, in the normal ordering, in the normal ordering, what happens is that you have one, two, and three. And here you have one, two, one, and three. Three is down, okay? This is the solar mass splitting, which is very small, okay? So, I mean, in the normal ordering, the minimum mass is 0.06, while in the inverted ordering is 0.1, okay? So, cosmology is measuring the hierarchy by imposing a limit on the total neutrino mass and not measuring individualities. For this, we we'll have to go very far in the future. That will be to somehow to see the kinks induced by one, two, three, okay? And then you will, be, you will see if it's one, two, three or one, two, three, you know, depending on the hierarchy, okay? Uh, so, yeah, thank you. The other way of measuring it is with neutrino oscillation experiments. But this is a completely different mechanism. And it's because neutrinos, when they travel through matter, they, are at, they, they interact, right? And matter induces an effective potential, okay? It's a coherent scattering of neutrinos with, with, with electrons present in matter, right? And then, if the hierarchy is normal, you, will, you should see an enhancement in the neutrino channel, while if the hierarchy is inverted, you, will, you should see an enhancement in the anti-neutrino channel. That's why experiments as Dune or Hyper-K or Super-K now are being built or have been built, okay, to measure this, uh, this hierarchy. Uh, uh, of course, it's a direct measurement. This is an indirect measurement because it's via some m new. You are not really measuring the sign of this splitting which is the idea, to measure the sign of this splitting, okay? You are not really measuring that. You are measuring the total mass and then imposing a, a bound, okay? Is it clear? Okay. okay. More questions? I, I have a question. Yeah? Uh, ah, here. 
Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to know a bit, uh, a bit better. How can you, um, I mean, this effect of the suppression of the power spectrum manifests itself a bit on the mildly nonlinear regime already. So how can you separate the effect of massive neutrinos from galaxy formation or from baryonic effects or from other uh, very yeah. complicated processes yeah. in this there regime? Are, there, are, there are several approaches, right? There are simulations, right? Embodied simulations that can do uh, their job. There are also... Uh, uh, calculations, right? Perturbation, uh, perturbation theory. In per, in, I mean, you apply perturbation theory, right? You don't, you don't stay to the linear level. You go further, right? There are some approaches, of, of course. I mean, and there are, there are simulations, for instance, the coyote simulation and such. I mean, it's true that to rely, you should rely on this, but also you can test this against observations, okay? So, the simulations, I mean, right? So, I mean, you can calibrate somehow this, okay? So it's when you get into the nonlinear regime, it's more difficult, but still you can deal with that, okay? So I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's something that you have to, it's just to keep, to keep in mind that it's not just the simple calculation in the linear regime, right? This is just an approach. You have to go farther, right? It's like when you measure, whenever, whenever you measure any process, right? Uh, there is the, the three-level thing, and then after they come the corrections, as with an effective, right? The three-level calculation of an effective is three, as we saw, as we said yesterday. But then you have to add these corrections. So the same with neutrino masses. If you are assuming a matter, uh, the matter power spectrum in the linear regime, you will get a limit, but, that, but this limit will get somehow distorted when you need to account for that. But people are working on that, of course, and I mean, uh, uh, I mean, Raúl, for instance, uh, is, uh, and his collaborators are. are are experts on this, and I mean, or, or also the, the, the other guy, guy I mentioned, Mateo Biel also works on these simulations, um, Francisco Villescusa Navarro as well. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm working with, uh, with Raul. Ah, okay. Uh, so, so you will be an expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. One last question, otherwise, before, we stay here. Until yeah, before we, we move to the high energy frontier. Uh, in standard model, we cannot explain uh, neutrino masses, so it, it looks a bit not self-consistent to restrain neutrino masses using only the standard model. So I wonder uh, what are the constraints would be on neutrino masses if we introduce some non-minimal uh, standard models that uh, will explain also neutrino masses. Okay, I mean, the standard model cannot explain them, can accommodate them, okay? In two ways, either you assume that the neutrino is a Dirac particle, and then you introduce a right-handed neutrino, or you assume that the neutrino is its own antiparticle, and then it's a Majorana one, right? There are models, of many, many models. One, the most famous one is the CISO model, right? And there are some called textures that they predict some, some, some um, spectrum for the neutrino masses, right? Like if it's normal or it's inverted, okay? But really, really, you cannot really put a bound on the neutrino mass from, 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 from particle physics, except for the limits from neutrino oscillation experiments, which don't measure the mass individually. They measure mass square differences, okay? So, I mean, from the point of view of a standard model, it's very important, really, to identify the, 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 the I mean, to identify this, this, this hierarchy first, and then after also to measure the individual the neutrino mass. Because, I mean, this can really put a bound on, 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 on models, and not only on models, also on, on searches of, 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 of uh, direct searches at labs, and also of the neutrino character, right? I mean, so uh, the, 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 the total mass of neutrinos, it's really, a, it's really a guide for future experiments in particle physics, right? So that's, wha that's why it's so important, this complementarity, okay? So I keep going for a bit, okay? Just for like, uh, I mean, I don't, I, poor, they are tired, I mean, it's already like, they are hungry, tired. Yeah, yeah, yes, five minutes, yeah, I mean, just an introduction. Just to motivate them, and uh, and that's it. I mean, just to start with what, what I'm gonna say. I mean, um, okay, this is already. Let me see. I, I I will do like this. I don't want to to touch this again because maybe. I mean, here they are very very good. Ah, okay. So, this is just just to practice with this cam online. You don't need to to download it if you have problems. Okay. So. 
high energy neutrinos. So we are now here, okay? <laughs> we just uh, we just uh, gain a lot of energy, okay? And we are there. So why is so important? Why are so important high energy neutrinos, okay? Well, both from the point of view of particle physics and particle astrophy and astrophy astroparticle physics or astrophysics, they are really important because they. From the particle physics point of view, they prove neutrino properties, interactions, and fundamental uh, pro, uh, fundamental symmetries at highest energies. Okay, and from the astrophysics point of view, because they can unravel the origin of the ultra high energy cosmic rays. Okay, that is is good enough. Okay, so ca how, what can we measure? We can measure cross sections, neutrino fluxes, flavor ratios. Arrival times, uh, the spatial distribution, and also do a multi messenger connection with gamma researches. That Francesca Calori is gonna is gonna talk about that. Okay, so realize that cosmic rays, ultra high energy or, or high energy and ultra high energy neutrinos and gamma rays are together. Okay, so I mean, it's not that you you if you produce one, you will produce the other. Okay, so I mean for sure. Okay, very good. So experimental parameters that we need to measure the, the, flux, the fluxes, um, we depend also on the pointing resolution, on the sky coverage, the flavor, uh, the effective area, be careful of the backgrounds, right? So I mean, because we are looking into the sky again. So this is some sort of, of thing here of all the physics that can affect high energy neutrinos. At production, we can have heavy relics, Dharma, they, can, they might come from dark matter annihilation that we heard uh, from the great uh, uh, Tracy's lectures. Dark matter decays, right? All these act as production. A detection, extra dimensions, leptoquarks, uh, monopoles, and during propagation, if neutrinos and dark matter interact, okay, neutrinos might, might have some sort of interaction with dark matter that we also heard from, from, from Tracy's lectures. That dark energy neutrino interactions, neutrino decays, Lorentz and CPT violation, long range interactions, supersymmetry. So, I mean, we can learn a lot of, a lot of stuff from detecting high energy neutrinos. Many, many things, many, 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 many. And this is my last slide today. But, but keep, keep, keep this in mind. What is important for neutrinos? First, they are not charged. So they are undeflected by magnetic fields. Protons are charged and they are deflected by magnetic fields. So I mean, they point directly back to the source. Okay? When, we, when we detect a high energy neutrino, we can reconstruct the incoming direction and where this neutrino is coming from. Okay? And unlike photons, neutrinos don't get absorbed. Okay? Don't get absorbed. They interact really, really weakly. Okay, so there is a, all this region in the universe. Here I show you the logarithm of, uh, the, uh, of the of the observable distance versus the logarithm of the energy. There is a huge region in the universe that can't be observed with leptons or with photons, sorry, or charged particles. Okay, because protons, as you know, I showed you the picture yesterday of, of these three scientists. Protons. Get, get absorbed or, or, or interact right with the uh, CMB photons via the GCK cutoff, and photons, inter, uh, protons interact with the with the CMB photons, and photons themselves, high energy photons, interact with the CMB photons and the, with the infrared and optical backgrounds. Okay, so above 10 to the 14 eV, the universe is opaque to photons. We cannot see in the universe with photons. We need another glasses, right? Okay? So, you know, it's like if you have a glass, uh, some sort of glasses, and you cannot see uh, above a given energy, okay? So, the glasses of photons are useless above 10 to the 14 EV, okay? So, um, we expect that uh, high and ultra high energy uh, neutrinos and cosmic rays are similar. And this is very important. Because we can make a connection between the three of them, okay? And we are talking about now multi-messenger cosmology, okay? Multi-messenger uh, tests, right? So how many of you are working on, on this, on, on, high, on, on, on high energy uh, photons or, I mean, photo, uh, you, okay? All, and you are working on high, uh, high energy neutrinos, right? You too, so I mean, okay. But, I mean, it's, 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 it's like, I mean, it's... It's something like when, when, we look and, uh, when we look into the universe via 
CMB via matter, matter power spectrum, right? This is the same. We are looking to the universe with photons, protons, high energy cosmic ray and neutrinos, okay? And tomorrow I will explain you uh, more about these high energy neutrinos, okay? Thank you. Questions? Actually, I have one. <coughs> yeah. So you taught us the, uh, yesterday that there's a cosmic uh, neutrino background. Yeah. So I was wondering, could you have some kind of GZK cut coming from these high energy neutrinos yeah. hitting this cosmic neutrino and producing, yeah. producing stuff like pions or whatnot? Well, yeah, I mean, you have this new, new bar, for instance, C, right? And, and then. Yeah, but even lower energies, no? You can have like, I don't well, know, like yeah. uh, two pions, you can have uh, even two photons, but maybe it's too weak, no? It's yeah, weak yeah, 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 I think so, yeah. Mm. You could have, I mean, in some sort of models of extra dimension, you could have an enhancement of the cross section. Mm -hmm. So you can test some of these uh, cro uh, enhanced cross sections with this, with this, uh, with this mechanism. Even if you don't go to the CMB one, but you go to the, well, cosmic one, let's say CMB-like one, <laughs> you go to the supernova relic neutrinos, right? The supernova relic neutrino background, which is, uh, the uh -huh. energy is much higher. It's, but it's, it's MEV. Less, but it's less uh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. The, the number density is smaller, but mm. the energy is higher. So you don't need such a huge enhancement, you know? Okay. Uh, such a huge, has such a huge energy of this other guy. Okay, okay. We'll ask, I will ask you offline, because we were thinking about something along this okay. line. Okay, so. very good. Uh, any anyone any uh, any other question? I guess not. So yes, no, no. Let's have yes. lunch again. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's discuss over lunch. Okay. Thank you again, Olga. Thank you.